So we're still going through our uh, review of the JavaScript language. Hopefully I'll finish that off today. Uh, I kind of gather from some of the interaction that I've had with Chi uh, during the week that a lot of you have probably progressed down to the second lab, the functions lab, even though I haven't covered functions. So that kind of tells me you're uh, you're ahead of me really. That That's okay. I don't mind that for the beginning. Uh, we'll get into the, the newer stuff uh, hopefully next week, which is definitely next week anyway. But like I said, T, um, last week, we do have to set a common base for everybody. And so we decided the common base is everybody needs to be familiar with JavaScript. We can't assume that you're uh, familiar with it before doing this module. Okay, so we were looking at the data side of JavaScript the last day. And it's all about objects, which are essentially key value pairs. It's a often referred to as a map or a dictionary as well. Set of key value pairs uh, where each key value pair is referred to as a property. And the values associated with a property can be anything, can be a primitive or it could be an object as well. So we have this notion of nested objects. Properties can be dynamically added or removed from an object at runtime. Uh, the other characteristic of JavaScript from a kind of data point of view is that it's dynamically typed. In other words, a variable's type can change during runtime. And I think I did mention to you, even though that's uh, acceptable from the language's point of view, it's probably not a great idea to have variables and the nature of what that variable is referring to changes significantly during runtime because that can potentially confuse other people that are reading your code. That's why we have a language called TypeScript. If you've heard of TypeScript, TypeScript is a typed form of JavaScript, but uh, we're sticking with JavaScript anyway. So uh, that was objects. And uh, also I mentioned the last DT to be this, uh, this very commonly reoccurring error that pretty much everybody gets uh, when they start playing around with, with the language. And it mainly arises as a result of you having some sort of data structure, typically a data structure that you've retrieved from some web API and your understanding of the structure of that structure or the shape of that structure uh, is incorrect and you're trying to, you've got an expression in your code that's drilling down into some inner part of that data structure, but um, the particular part that you're trying to access doesn't exist. Uh, so you get this, this error that I've mentioned to you. And really it's not until it arises that <laughs> uh, you come back to me and you say, what's this error all about? And then I can remind you of the fact that I told you that it was going to happen. So anyway, uh, that's something to quote unquote, look forward to. Now, uh, so that's objects, uh, set of key value pairs, any language worth its salt has to have arrays, uh, an, array data, um, an array structure. As it turns out, JavaScript does not have arrays natively built into it, most other languages do. But uh, it's, we still can use arrays within JavaScript, even though behind the scenes, when we declare an array and we declare arrays in the literal sense, pretty much the same as we do in all other languages. Uh, syntactically, it looks like all other languages, but behind the scenes, an array is actually stored in memory as an object with key value pairs where the keys are actually the index values. Um, that's just a by the way, knowing that isn't necessarily useful to you, but uh, it's just something to know behind the scenes. So uh, declaring array looks like this, and it just looks like, as I said, looks like the way you would do it in any other language. Use your square brackets to enclose your array, and then your values are separated with commas. The values can be of mixed type. Um, again, that's allowed, but it's probably not a great idea. It's better to have your arrays storing one particular data type, be they objects or primitives. Uh, 
and we access properties, we, sorry, we access elements within our array using uh, the subscript notation. So it's quite similar to objects in that sense, but the subscript is always an index. Uh, it's an integer value. And I'm, I'm assuming people are familiar with using indexes anyway, so I need to go into that. Um, so yeah, I'm just mentioning there that they're actually arrays. Uh, arrays are actually objects behind the scene. Now, as well as being uh, being able to index into particular elements within the array, there are also some methods that uh, are quite useful. Uh, and the most popular ones would be push and pop, uh, which I'm mentioning over here. Push and pop are methods for adding elements to the tail or the end of, of an array. And you've also got shift and unshift which are methods for adding elements to the front or the head of an array. And you've got join and some other methods as well. And just a quick look at the syntax, which again is not going to be very surprising really, but uh, so this is the little archive that we had from last week. So here's where I'm just documenting arrays. So here I'm declaring an array. And again, whether you use letter const is up to you. Typically, we would use const, uh, to be honest, because even though I'm declaring an array here, if I did declare it as const, I can still add elements to that ar array and remove elements from the array. What I cannot do, as you can remember from the last days, I cannot reassign this nums variable to a different array or to a completely different uh, type of um, data entirely. And I've commented out some of the code. So, you know, if you want to iter if you want to iterate over an array, this is how you would do it in ES5, kind of old JavaScript. If you want to do a for loop in ES6, you can still use the old syntax, but there is a slightly different version of the for loop. Now, as it turns out, we very rarely use the for loop. When we want to iterate over an array, we use a different approach, and you'll see that a little bit later on today. Here, I'm just demonstrating the push and pop and shift and unshift. So, you know, you can play around with this uh, yourself. I'm not going to walk my way through it now. Um, you're up and running at this stage, so I'll allow you to, to discover these things yourselves. But uh, here, I'm using push and pop to add and remove an element from the tail. And down here, I'm using shift and unshift. So I'm using push and pop there. Here I'm using shift and unshift. Shift is when you want to remove an element from the head. Unshift is when you want to add an element to the to the head. So just to uncomment those various lines and go back to your index.html and enable this particular script and uh, see for yourself, confirm for yourself that it's behaving the way you would expect it to behave. So I'll let that GE really, I'm not going to step my way through that. So that's it about arrays really, declaring them and referencing elements within them and then manipulating the array using these utility methods. A utility method is nothing other than a function property uh, associated with an array. That's just by the way. So you know, technically, technically, given that I said an array is really stored as a an object internally within the within your code, when you've got an expression like let's see, uh, like this one here, technically push is a property of the nums object. The value associated with the push property is actually a function, which we are, we've yet to look at. So really what you're calling here, you're invoking a function here that's defined within the uh, my nums array, and we're passing some arguments to that function. That's how you would interpret it from an object's point of view. Uh, but as I, as I keep kind of correcting myself, don't think of it in terms of objects because that, that doesn't really help us. Just think of it in the traditional sense of an array. The next aspect that I want to cover in this set of slides is, well, sorry, before I talk about um, string templating. So 
with with just those two structures objects and arrays then they are the only two tools that we need to define any kind of complex data structure so for example if you want to define an array where each element in the array is is also an inner array then an expression like this would make sense here we're indexing into the fourth element in my outer array because the index begins at zero as you know so the expression array outer subscript to three that expression is going to evaluate to an array because I have inner arrays within it. And the subscript two, the subscript two then is indexing into one of those inner arrays. Alternatively, if you've got an array of objects, then an expression like this, this expression is going to evaluate to one object within my array. And so this is indexing into one property of that object. So getting used to this kind of syntax is something you will need to do uh, when you're playing around with JavaScript and you're dealing with complex data structures. Uh, and so this is the point that I was making at the beginning of the lecture here. Finally, string templating, uh, which most languages have at this stage, but JavaScript only introduced string templating in ES6. So prior to that, you know, we had to write fairly ugly expressions like this. When we wanted to construct a string, we had to perform what's called string concatenation. So all this plussing, adding bits together was very error prone. And that's why string templates were brought into the language. And that's why they are in other languages. So now we can write an expression like this here. Uh, the, these are not single quotes now at the outer side of this expression. These are back quotes. And a back quote tells the JavaScript runtime that what you're defining is a template. And within that template, anywhere you use the dollar curly brace, closed curly brace syntax, uh, you are... Uh, you are declaring an expression within your string template. And the way it's, uh, the effect of that is at runtime, what the JavaScript runtime will do is it will evaluate this expression first and then insert the result of that evaluation into your overall string. So here all I'm doing, it looks like anyway, all I'm doing is inserting variables into my, uh, into my string but you can have any kind of expression you want to between the curly braces. Uh, so maybe the sample in my set of samples is a slightly better illustration. So if you look at this one here, uh, okay, I've just got a string and a number here. I've got a little uh, function. Okay, this is kind of cart before horse now, but uh, wouldn't be impossible to work out what I'm doing here. I'm declaring a function, and the purpose of the function is to take a number uh, which notionally is representing a height or a measurement in uh, imperial and is converting it to metric. That's what my function is doing. Here's my string template, and I've got my back quotes uh, in closing it. Here I'm referencing just a local variable, but over here, I'm actually calling my function and passing it a parameter. And so what, what I've highlighted there, that gets executed first. And the result of that execution is what's inserted into my overall string. So you can have any expression you want to within your curly braces uh, embedded within your string template. Also, you can have in JavaScript, you can have multi-line strings. And that's what I'm illustrating here. Okay, again, I'm using the back quote as the beginning and end of my multi-line string. You also have to use parentheses to enclose your multi-line string to help the JavaScript runtime, essentially. If I take away those parentheses, then I think I will get a, um, I will get a runtime error. 
because it, it just uh, the runtime is kind of confused. Finally, all I'm illustrating down here is sometimes you want a string to include uh, single quotes or double quotes. So if your string includes uh, single quotes, sorry, double quotes, for example, here, then I'm using, then then I can I can uh, embed them in my using my string template. So it, it doesn't normally double quotes encloses a string. So if you like, I've got a string within a string, but because I'm representing the outer string as a string template, then it'll all work fine. There are the odd occasion, like when you're using apostrophe uh, uh, at the end of a word, then the apostrophe tends to match up with the beginning of the normal string, which also begins with a single quote, and that can confuse the runtime. Okay, uh, you will see string templates being used uh, a little bit in, on, on, um, in this module. Right, that's our tour of the data side of JavaScript. Next, I want to look at the behavioral side. So I go back to, I want to look at these slides here. And again, feel free to interrupt at any stage if you've got any questions. Sorry, now I'm trying to exit out of this. It's uh, problematic when you're doing presentations within Zoom. But I'll get there. So still leading with the fundamentals, but now switching over to uh, how we represent behavior or logic. And just as in the data side, we have essentially one construct, the object construct. On the behavioral side, we have one construct as well, which is called the function. So our functions are our main unit of composition or encapsulation of behavior. Now, uh, in the early days, uh, obviously JavaScript always had functions. Uh, and in ES5, I'm saying here, there were two ways you could declare a function, function declarations and function expressions. We'll see uh, examples of those in a moment. Just for the purpose of completeness, you, you also had this odd characteristic of JavaScript in the early days, something called hoisting. The, the effect of hoisting was that you could invoke a function before it was declared. So if I had a JavaScript file with code in it, uh, and down at the bottom of that file, I declared a function, I could actually invoke that function higher up in the file, which seems kind of peculiar. And the reason we could do that was because at runtime, what the runtime did was it hoisted all of your function declarations to the top of your file. And hence, it made sense then that you could actually invoke it while in um, in your static file, the function is declared after it's invoked uh, at runtime because of this hoisting idea, then the invocation of your function actually worked because of the, because the functions were hoisted to the top. Now, it was a peculiar kind of uh, runtime behavior. It's no longer really relevant to us today, but... If you come across it, that's what it's referring to. Now we can still, moving on to ES6, we can still use the function declaration and function expression form for declaring functions. And you'll see me using it sometimes. But also ES6 introduced a third form, which is called an arrow function style. Now there are two, there were two reasons why they introduced arrow functions. One was it's just a slightly cleaner syntax for declaring functions. 
The second relates to the this global variable uh, in JavaScript, and you, you you would be familiar with it maybe if you come from a Java background, you might be familiar with the this uh, global variable, and the this global variable is always pointing at what's referred to as the current context, which is really in JavaScript terms, it's really just an object, kind of a global object. But in JavaScript, the the, the context object that this is pointing at changes as your runtime executes. And so it was a major source of errors uh, in our code. Um, now, what the arrow function did was it tried to standardize the behavior of the this global variable in your code. Now, as it turns out, I don't use the this variable at all. It doesn't arise. Uh, and I, I, I don't think we actually use it at all throughout the this module, which is kind of a reflection of the attempt to hide, if you like, the need to use the, this global variable because it was a major source of errors. But as far as we're concerned, you know, the arrow function is just going to be a cleaner syntax for declaring functions. And there is, is even a shorthand version um, of this arrow function declaration, which again, once you get comfortable with it, it's probably a form that you would use quite a lot. It's quite uh, off-putting initially when you see it, though. It uh, can be difficult to decipher what the code is actually doing. Now, from day one, there's also been the notion of anonymous functions. As its name suggests, an anonymous function is a function that doesn't have a name, which kind of sounds peculiar. How can you invoke a function if it doesn't have a name? Turns out we use anonymous functions quite a lot, though, and you will see me starting to use them today, and you will see them a lot throughout this uh, module. Now, there's a separate uh, archive that you need to access for this a set of slides. And again, you will get at this archive if you go into the functions lab. So when you download that archive and unzip it and import it into VS Code, you will see something like the following. Same kind of structure as the previous uh, archive, as it turns out. I've got a whole bunch of JavaScript files, and I've just got a single, simple uh, index.html. And again, I'm going to stick with using the, uh, the live server that we installed from last week. So I'm going to click my go live in my status down here at the bottom. And again, open up my developer tools. Now, at the moment, my index.html is uh, only this script is enabled, which is referring to this one here. And I've just got various little samples of function declarations, function expressions, arrow functions, shorthand version of arrow functions, just to give you one example of each. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this now, so just quickly run down through it. Now, I've, I've, first of all, I've declared just some simple objects here. I've got a me object. I've got a her object. So it looks like me and her both represent uh, uh, people. And I've got a here object, which represents a place, it looks like. It's got a longitude and latitude. So in terms of functions, first thing I'm illustrating is the function declaration form of declaring a function. So I've got my keyword function, the name of my function, the parameters. Turns out there's only one parameter for this. And just based on the name that I've given to the function, it looks like the purpose of this function is to determine whether the parameter that's passed to it represents a person object. And the way I determine that is by looking to see does it have particular properties, does it have a name property, does it have a gender property, and you can see from the top here, the me object and the her object 
have those properties, whereas the here object doesn't have a gender property. Uh, so that's uh, from a, from a function's point of view, that's an example of function declaration. You begin with the function keyword, the name, the parameters, and the body of the function is enclosed in curly braces. So that's an example of a block scope, which I mentioned to you last week. Any variable declared inside in this function is only visible inside the function. And I'm just calling the function here. And so that's what you get uh, at the beginning of uh, up here. That's function declaration. Function expression is where you actually assign a function to a variable. Now note the function doesn't have a name here. The name for this function is actually taken from the variable name. But the fact that we can assign a function to a variable Um, Dermot, I can't hear you. Yeah, me neither. I think we lost the audio. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. How, how long was I inaudible? <laughs> two, two minutes or so. Okay. All right. We lost you at assigning um, the value from a function. Okay. Great. So it's not too far back, really. Uh, that's good. So much for my new mic. Right, so uh, so I was talking about the function expression form of declaring a function. And in this form, what you're doing is you're assigning a function to a variable. And so what that allows us to do is to essentially pass a function around the place. And by pass it around the place, I mean we could potentially pass a function as a parameter into another function. And that's an extremely powerful uh, ability to have and it's, it's something that for example in Java only became possible once lambdas were introduced to Java but from a syntax point of view uh, and it doesn't matter whether you use const or let but typically you would use const it's, you, know, you wouldn't tend to change assign a different function to a variable in terms of invoking this kind of function, you invoke it the same way you invoke function declarations. Uh, what does this function do as a matter of interest? Uh, so I'm passing, uh, I'm passing a hopefully a person object and a middle name string, and the purpose of the function is to add the middle name to the person object. Some people may already have a middle name. So if I look at my two sample objects. The me object doesn't have a middle name, whereas the her object does have a middle name. So if I want to add a middle name to an object, to a person that already has a middle name, then I simply just extend the middle name. Otherwise, I just add a new property called middle to the person's name. That's the way it's meant to work. Uh, the first thing I do, however, though, is I check to make sure that the first parameter that's passed to me, this thing, Check to make sure it is a, a person. So I'm using the function that I declared a little earlier. What I'm also illustrating here is how you can throw exceptions in JavaScript. Uh, we're just discovering that in passing. Uh, and all I'm doing here then is checking to see, I now know that the, the, the first parameter that was passed into me is a person. So I'm just checking to see, do they already have a middle 
property. Uh, and this is the old way of checking to see whether the property exists or not. You know, does this expression evaluate to undefined? Alternatively, I could have used the N operator, which I talked about last week. Uh, and eventually I return a true. So returning true just simply means everything worked okay. Now, because this function potentially could show an exception, then when I invoke the function, which I am doing here, I have to wrap the invocations in a try catch block. And I'm assuming people are familiar with try catch blocks from other languages. Uh, it's very, very similar to try catch blocks in, in Java, as you'll see. Uh, so the message is if your method throws an exception, then you've got to wrap the invocation in this try catch block. And so the way it works, as you know, is if the, so for example, this one here, uh, this line here, I've commented out because that is going to cause an exception to be thrown, which means the flow of control will just fall down to here. I'm just going to conveniently not explain try catch blocks now because I'm going to assume people are already familiar with them. If not, by all means, ask me to explain them. No, arrow functions then, I said, were introduced in ES6. So uh, the keyword function isn't appearing at all here now. So how do we know it is a function? Well, whenever you see this symbol, which notionally looks like an arrow, hence the name, when you see that symbol, you know that what's being declared is a function using the arrow syntax. To the left of the arrow is where you declare the parameters to the function. Uh, and enclose them in parentheses. To the right of the arrow is where you declare the body of the function, and the body is again wrapped in curly braces. So other than that, it's a bit like a function expression, except the keyword function is missing, and we have the arrow symbol instead. And based on the name, it looks like all this function does is it either sticks Mr. or Miss in front of the name and returns that as a string. Uh, if I could just as well, are we using it there? Sorry. So again, I just checked to see that it is a person. And oh yeah, what, just to explain this line here, the what I'm using here is what's referred to as the ternary operator, which is this question mark operator. The way the ternary operator works is it evaluates the expression to the left of the operator, and that's either going to evaluate to true or false. If it evaluates to true, then it takes the value to the right of the question mark, but before the colon, in other words, this. And that is, if you like, the result of the ternary operator expression. In this case, the result is simply assigned to my variable. Alternatively, if this expression evaluates to false, then it takes what's to the right of the colon, and that's the result of the ternary operator. So title is either going to have the string Mr. or Miss assigned to it, and then I just return a, I return a string template using the person's name and the title that I've computed. I could have been kind of clever, right? I could have taken all of this here and substituted down here and it would still work because we know we can put an expression inside our curly braces. You can play with that yourselves in your own time if you wish. So that's arrow functions. Now there is a shorthand version of the arrow function. And there are three parts to how you can reduce the syntax. Now, what I often say to students is at the beginning, you know, if this is your first time using arrow functions, then use the longhand version, which is what you see up here. Uh, once you start getting comfortable, then, you know, you may gradually start introducing the shorthand version. And the shorthand version is just simply less typing. So there are three parts. If I go back to my slides, 
there are three parts to how you can shorten the uh, the syntax. Uh, let's see. So number one is if if the body if the body of the arrow function is a single statement, then you don't need to use the curly braces to wrap the body. You can leave those out. Secondly, if there's only one parameter to my arrow function, then you can leave out the parentheses. And thirdly, if there is only a single statement in the body of my arrow function, and that is the return value of that function, then you can drop the keyword return. So going back to my code, So here I've got a function, it looks like, based on the name anyway, that it just determines whether a person has a middle name or not. And there's only one parameter, person. So I've dropped the parentheses. Earlier, I had this wrapped in parentheses because it's only a single parameter, I can drop it. I've got my arrow symbol, but I've got no curly braces. Here's the body of my function. And this is also the return value of my function. In this case, the return value is going to be a Boolean true or false. And so this big long expression, uh, first of all, checking to see is it a is the parameter a person? And then I'm just checking to see, you know, does the person have a middle name already? Is there a middle name property uh, buried within it? So to convert this to the longhand version, Use your parentheses to be more explicit. Use your curly braces for your body. And critically, if 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 I leave it as it is now, you're going to get an error because there is no there needs to be an explicit return statement uh, in your function and there needs to be an explicit return when uh, you've got your your curly braces being used. So you need to go return. Uh, sometimes you can get away without the return actually, but uh, it's uh, it's clear to the reader. Certainly, if it's a one liner, you know it's uh, it's okay maybe to leave it out. But uh, I've sometimes I've come across where it does actually throw an error when you leave out the explicit return and you're using your parentheses. So that's the short hand anyway, leaving all of that extra syntax out. Let's go back to where we were. What's next? Okay, next is anonymous functions. Let's see where we are in the slides. Oh yeah, and all I'm showing you in this screenshot is, as you know, I mentioned it to you the last day, if when you write modern JavaScript, it does have to be converted back to old or ES5 JavaScript before it's executed in the browser, just to, in case the browser is, uh, is not able to, to run modern JavaScript. So we just do it by default. And the tool, the dominant tool for doing that today is a tool called Babel, although there are alternatives appearing. Now, Babel have a website as well that can be useful to play with maybe initially, uh, although I don't necessarily think that you would need to, but here's the Babel website. And if you click on the try it out, what you can do is you can paste in a piece of modern JavaScript in this box on the left, and it will show you the equivalent ES5 uh, on the right. So if, for example, I take an arrow function from my code there, I just grab this. You can see what's on the right now is what, what we would have written, you know, whatever, uh, where are we now, 2023, maybe eight or nine years ago, like the keyword var 
was the way we declared a variable. There was no let and const. There was only var available to us, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, again, a bit like knowing that an array is actually represented as an object internally, knowing what modern JavaScript looks like in old JavaScript isn't necessarily of any use to us anymore either. But there you go anyway. One or two other uh, characteristics, some of which are useful to know and others probably slightly less so. Now, there is this notion of constructor functions. Now, if you know anything about programming, you know when we use the word constructor in relation to logic, we're talking about creating instances of things. So in context of the little sample code that we had here, it would be nice if we had a constructor function for creating instances of person objects. I just kind of quoted them, quoted them in longhand in, in a literal form. But you can use a function to behave like a constructor in the conventional sense. Again, uh, we don't need to do it in this module, but it's it's there. Uh, in very general terms, you, your constructor function is coded like an ordinary function. However, the way you actually use it is slightly different. You have to use the keyword new in front of the function invocation. And whatever that function returns, then that typically becomes an instance of the particular type of data object that you want to create. So it looks like here, I've got a constructor for creating person objects. And this entire expression here would return an object and I'm assigning it to the variable him. So the him variable would point at an object similar to the kind of hand-coded hand person objects that I had on the uh, from my code. Uh, so, and if we looked at the body of our person function, it would simply create a, an empty object and then uh, add properties to that object based on the parameters that were passed to it. You can read up on it yourselves if you wish to, but we we won't actually get to need to use them. Uh, when we talk about programming in general, and we talk about functions, because other languages have functions as well, they call them methods typically though, uh, we talk about the side effect of a function. A function has a side effect if it changes something outside of its scope. Okay, that's 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 the statement, right? A function has a side effect if it changes something outside of its scope. Uh, so, for example, okay, I, I did only skim over them, but we had the add middle name function there in our sample code and we passed in an object to it, the person A, maybe the me object. Now that me object is outside of the scope of the add middle name function. And when we looked at the body of this function, it did actually change the me object that was passed into it. So we would say that the add middle name function causes side effects. Alternatively, the salute uh, the salute method that we had in our sample code there, okay, it was passed in a person object as well, but it didn't make any changes to that person object. So we would say that the salute method does not have or does not cause any side effects. And side effects are something that we try and minimize in our code. That's a kind of a high level objective, but uh, as it turns out, if a function performs IO because IO is something that is kind of exists outside of the function, then technically speaking, such a function also causes side effects. And this notion of side effects is something that will reoccur a little bit later on uh, in our discussion on React. Also a general programming notion is the notion of pure functions. Pure functions are functions that do not cause side effects. And a kind of high level objective when you're writing code is to try and maximize the number of functions that are pure functions. The reasoning behind it is it's become it's it's a lot easier to rationalize and understand your code if it consists of predominantly pure functions. And there is a whole area of programming called functional programming. And functional programming maximizes the 
the amount of pure functions and minimizes the number of side effect functions in your code. So it's a programming style or a programming paradigm, uh, which is very interesting to look at. Um, but again, that's just by way of background. Although, as I said, the notion of side effects is something that we will see uh, when we talk about React. Higher order functions are functions that take a function as an argument, and presumably it invokes that, uh, that argument internally within it. Also, higher order function extends to the idea of a function that returns a function as its, uh, as its result. Uh, and we will see higher order functions being used all over our code. And it's a, it's a coding style that you just need to get comfortable with. So, uh, so in terms of definition, that's what a, a higher order function is. It's a function that, that takes a function as a parameter predominantly. Optionally as well, it may actually return a function. Now, by way of getting some familiarity with this higher order function uh, style of programming, because it is a very, it's kind of central really to the way we code in JavaScript. Uh, and to get you familiar with it, what I've decided to do is to look at the array data type because it has a number of uh, higher order functions associated with it. Uh, and we will use these quite a lot during this course. Now, the, 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 the word or the term function and method are interchangeable. Um, and you will sometimes I use the term method. Sometimes I use the term function to refer to the same thing, but just uh, just be aware of that function and method. So when I talk about higher order function, we could equally, equally be talking about higher order methods because methods are nothing other than a function, which is a property of an object. Okay, if I just say that again. A method is just simply a a property of an object which is whose value is actually a function. Right. So the array data type anyway has a number of methods or functions associated associated with it. And quite a number of them have this higher order characteristic. And I'm listing a few of them here. So if we look at the for each one first, which is the simplest one. Here's a generic uh, illustration of it. So it looks like I've got a, an array here. I'm declaring an array, uh, literally. And here I'm calling the for each method on that array. And the for each method is an example of a higher order function stroke method because the parameter, and it only takes one parameter as it turns out. It, some higher order functions take more than one parameter, uh, but the for each only takes one parameter. And the parameter happens to be a function. And not only that, it's actually an anonymous function. Uh, the function doesn't have a name. The way the for each works, which you're probably familiar with, the way the for each works is this function is invoked once for each element in the array. And each time the uh, we refer to this function parameter as a callback, which I mentioned down here, so this callback is invoked uh, once for each element in my array. And each time the callback is invoked, it's passed some parameters. And the parameters are the, a reference to the element, the current element that's being processed, uh, the index position of that element, and the entire array itself. Often these two arguments here are, are not used at all. We're only interested in the first one. And in the body of my anonymous function, you can do whatever you want to. Typically, in the body, you're doing something to the element that's being passed in. Now, by doing something, I mean not changing it as such. Typically, you might be checking some characteristic of it or just console logging it out to the screen. So the terminology is for each is a higher order function. Uh, in this case, this higher order function only takes one parameter. That parameter is a function itself. We refer to that generically as a callback. And uh, I've explained how, how the for each higher order function uses that callback. Uh, finally, I'm saying down here that up here, okay, I've, 
I've coded the callback using the function declaration syntax. Uh, it's more common now to use the arrow form of a function for declaring your anonymous function, but you don't have to, but it tends to be the style that's more commonly used today. Now, often a tangent for one second, but there's, there's a reason why. So what I'm showing you here is a screenshot from a web API called the Random User Web API. A web API is a, is a piece of functionality that you can invoke over the HTTP protocol. So we can send HTTP requests to this, if you like, to this website, if you like, but it's, it's really a web API. And the response that we will get back from this web API will be an array of randomly generated user profiles. Uh, and it will return as many as you ask it for. So it just randomly generates uh, objects. Those objects have uh, predetermined properties and the objects notionally represent a user. So you'd have a name, date of birth, age, password, that kind of stuff. So for example, if we actually enter this URL here into a browser, what it would return is, uh, is in this case, it would return 10 uh, user, uh, randomly generated user profiles or user objects for me. We, we don't want to access it this way. We actually want to invoke it from within our JavaScript code. So I've got a bunch of samples and each of the samples is essentially implementing this uh, architecture for me. So the way it's going to work is I have my go live server again, as I have uh, had before. And when I start up my browser and then start up my go live server, it's going to serve me my HTML page, which we'll see in a second. Uh, there'll be very little in that HTML page other than a reference to a some scripts. Then my browser is going to grab those scripts from the go live through the go live server as well. The scripts will be downloaded uh, one by one and installed and executed within the browser. So it's very similar to what we've been doing so far, but in this case the the JavaScript scripts are going to communicate with my random user web API, and it's going to return back uh, an array of user profiles. And then I'm just going to process those user profiles and output some stuff to the console. And the processing of those profiles, the profiles will be in the form of an array. Hence, I'm going to get an opportunity to use those higher order methods that I mentioned in relation to the array type, like for each filter map reduce. So this is the way I'm, uh, I, I haven't purposefully complicated this now. Uh, the, the kind of architecture that I'm showing you here, that is going to be fundamental to all of the stuff that we're going to be doing in React as it turns out. So it's overkill for, for the purpose of this stage in the module, but it will serve as well, hopefully a little bit later on. So let's see it in action. So I need to go into my index.html and I'm gonna disable that script and enable this one. And we just let it do its thing first. If I save that, go back to my browser. So these names here now actually were uh, were generated by the random user web API and the script, which we'll look at in a moment. The script uh, made a request to the random user API for I think it was six or whatever number of users. And then the objects that came back, it went through those using the for each. And it's just uh, console logging the users' names and their title, I think. So how did I write the code? So uh, every browser has the fetch uh, 
uh, function built into it. And we use the fetch function to make a HTTP call. And so I'm making the HTTP call to my web API that I've mentioned. Now, fetch is very, it's, it's just an ordinary function, but uh, it's obviously quite different in the sense that the response from the fetch is something that's going to happen asynchronously. Every functions that we've been looking at so far could be categorized as synchronous. You know, they, they, they execute immediately, they respond with a result immediately, and we can write nice sequential code, but um, a nice synchronous sequential code, but that's not the case with fetch. And that's why we've got this kind of odd stuff going on here. So I, I think you should, try and treat what I'm highlighting, which is try and treat this as kind of boilerplate uh, as a way of dealing with asynchronous um, communication in JavaScript. You'll get a more detailed explanation of a little bit later on, but like I could have gone the long-handed way. All I'm doing here is meta chaining. Like I'm invoking the fetch method passing it an argument, which it expects to be a URL. Eventually, that uh, fetch will respond with a result. The result will be the response that comes back from the web API, but that's uh, something that's going to happen in the future. It's not going to happen immediately. Eventually, when it does respond, I then call the then method on that response. Uh, and as it turns out, the then method is an example of a higher order function technically. So we pass it a, an anonymous function, which is what I'm doing here. This anonymous function uh, is invoked by then, and it passes to the anonymous function the response that comes back from the web API in its kind of raw form. And what the body of the anonymous function does is it structures the response that comes back, it converts it into JSON format. But in addition, the response in general terms could be fragmented. It could be a stream that is fragmented and needs to be reassembled in very general terms, probably not in the case of the random user web API. The response is probably just gonna be enclosed in one fragment, but in general terms, the response could be fragmented. So we need to reassemble all of that, those fragments into one unit. And that is what the, the JSON method does for us, as well as converting the response into the JSON format. So technically, technically this is also an, uh, an asynchronous operation. It happens over a period of time. Eventually, when all of the fragments have been uh, reassembled, only at that stage does this part of the code start executing. We call another, we invoke the then method again, pass it an anonymous function. In the case of this anonymous function, when we invoke the anonymous function, the parameter that we pass to it is the, as the name suggests there, is the body of the response that came back from my web API, the full body, fully reassembled. And that body is going to be a some sort of a JSON data structure. And then in the body of this particular uh, anonymous function, I'm processing the response that came back from the web API. Now, I would have to look up the documentation of the web API to understand the structure of the response. I happen to know from doing that, that in the response that comes back, it is an object. That object has a property called result. So that's why I'm uh, referencing the result property of this. The expression response body dot result is going to be my array of randomly user, uh, randomly generated user profiles. So eventually now, what I have here now is an array, and that's really what I want to concentrate on. So everything above, I just had to add it in that code in order to communicate with the web API. 
that was the, if you like, the overcomplication that I, you could argue that I made. What we want to really discuss is the array type and the higher order functions associated with the array type. But I did bury that inside this uh, web API kind of uh, context. So again, for now, maybe treat this as kind of boilerplate. Whenever you're talking to a web API from a piece of JavaScript code, then you have to essentially kind of cut and paste what I've highlighted and pick up the story really from kind of from here on in terms of the processing of the response that comes back. Um, if I happen to have a console.log down here, Okay. When I, when this piece of code executes, even though I've got console.logs up here, the first console.log that's going to execute is this one. And I pose a question, why is that? I'll just prove it to you. If I save that and go back to my browser. Okay. You can see hello came out first and then my, uh, my set of users uh, were output from the console.log here. Any idea why this executes first before these ones? You'd imagine these would execute first. And the answer really is because this code here is asynchronous code. So that's what we're, that's the additional complication that, that we've added into this uh, Purposefully now, in, in my case, uh, I don't want to be uh, downplaying it. Uh, it's an asynchronous piece of code. It does not execute in the order in which you see it here. And I've tried to explain that uh, there by, by virtue of when I was explaining this code here. So anyway, that console.log executes first because it uh, it's waiting for the response to come back from the web API. It's waiting for that, the, the first part of the response to come back before we can execute this. And it's waiting for the entire response to come back before we can execute this. Uh, and that's kind of built into the browser. It knows how to deal with that. Okay, back to arrays and higher order functions. I eventually have an array here. Here I'm calling the for each higher order function on that array. And all I'm doing is, uh, here's my higher order function beginning here. Let me just give an extra space so we can see. There's the beginning of my higher order function coded as an arrow function. Uh, now the higher order function takes potentially, sorry, the, the anonymous function that you pass to for each potentially takes three arguments. If I go back to my slides, you know, I had an example of for each here. And I said, look, there's three arguments that it takes. But the second and third one are optional. If you don't need them, then you don't need to include them. And that is the case here. I don't need them, so I don't include them. So a person is going to be pointing at one user within my array of users and I just console.log a uh, particular uh, part of that user. So I'm I'm indexing into it. Uh, do I have another console.log there? No. If I if I just stick another console.log up here actually just to show you the full response that comes back. I thought maybe I'll just use this one. My console.log. Save that. That's often a good idea when you're working with a new web API and you're not sure what is the actual structure, the full response that comes back to me. Just do a console.log at the very beginning. And sorry. 
So here it is here. And if we expand it, quite a lot, but we're only interested in this part here. And there are my user, uh, user profiles. And if I drill down a little bit further to look at one of them, Okay, that's a full user profile. So now I've got a better understanding and even within that there are some still further levels of detail. For example, if I go into DOB, you know, I've got some more detail in there. So make sure you understand the structure before you start playing with the data. Okay, so the purpose of this example was number one, to show you how to make HTTP calls from within JavaScript. That's the purpose of the fetch. And the second is a simple illustration of using the for each higher order function on an array, in this case, an array of uh, user objects, if you like. Right, there are uh, three other higher order functions that I want to talk about, but we will use the exact same context now talking to random user web API. So the for each is fine, we've discussed that. The filter higher order function associated with an array, it also takes a callback and that's its only argument as it turns out. What the filter function does is it executes the callback for each element within the array. And the callback in this case is meant to return a Boolean true or false. If it returns a true, then the current entry, array entry that's being processed is uh, put into an output array. And so after the filter has gone through the entire source array, if you like, what it will generate as, a re as an overall result is a subset of that source array where each element in the subset uh, computed a Boolean true for the particular callback function that was passed to it. So as the name suggests, we're taking an input array and we're filtering out certain elements within the uh, source array. So it's uh, it selects a subset of elements from the source array as mentioned. I'm also telling you that the uh, the selected elements are added to a new array, which I'm referring to as my kind of output array. The selected, the source array is unchanged. Hence, we would say that filter is a pure function. And an illustration of it is in the 03 filter JS script. And so if we look at that, we'll enable it first. And if we glance at the script, again, it has the uh, the fetch call in it, so we can kind of skip over that and pick up the story from here. That's my array, full array of user profiles. By the way, every time you send a request to the random user web API, well, as the name kind of suggests, it generates a completely different set of user profiles every single time, even when you refresh, if you refresh the browser page, you know, it's essentially a separate request to the API, and so it's a different data set. So to illustrate the filter, let's suppose this was my objective. I want to find all female profiles. One of the properties, presumably, of the user allows me to do that. Now, if I didn't want to use filter, I could use a standard for loop approach. So this would be, if you like the, the non JavaScript way of doing it, even though this is JavaScript code that I've highlighted here, that would still work, you know? So typically like you create an empty array first, then you have a standard for loop that iterates over the array and you put entries into your empty array as you discover them. So I've got some sort of condition test to check to see is the user um, 
female or not. So that would that's certainly going to work, but it's not the the JavaScript way of doing it. Here's how you would do it using filter, calling filter on my array and and passing it a callback. And in this case, I'm using the arrow style, and you know there is a single statement as it turns out. So I could have used the shorthand version rather than the longhand version of the arrow. But as I said, in the case of the filter, the callback that you pass the filter needs to return a Boolean true or false. And so here's the return statement, and that is a logic expression. So it is going to return true or false for me. And again, if I wanted to be clever, I could say, well, I don't need thing is there's a single parameter. I don't need well, sorry, I'm using the other one, am I? Why did I include index there? I don't really use index, so I can actually get rid of that. I can get rid of this. I can get rid of the return statement. I can get rid of the closing curly brace. And all of that should still work for me. More than likely now I've got a syntax error. Let's gamble it. I knew we'd have a syntax error. I have an extra. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's a real gotcha. That colon there actually is tricking it up. So I think if I get rid of that, it should be happy. Yeah, that's a real gotcha actually when you use the uh, it's kind of fortunate that it did turn out uh, turn up there now, actually. When you use the shorthand version uh, of the arrow function and the arrow function is being used as a callback, then don't uh, include the semicolon. Uh, as you just saw, that actually confuses the runtime interpreter. It's a really low level error that uh, can arise, but uh, you actually saw it anyway in practice. So if I put back in my semicolon here, which is just the statement terminator, you'd imagine it's fairly harmless there, but it does actually confuse the runtime as you see. Okay. Um, that's probably the only um, occasion when those arrow functions do actually cause uh, problems for you. Moving on, uh, another example of using a filter. In this case, I want to find males under a certain age. So, you know, it's just more of the same, really. Here's my arrow function here, my anonymous function, my callback, whatever you want to refer to it. And it's got a slightly longer uh, logic for determining whether it should return a Boolean true or false. So you can study that in your own time. That's filter. The map higher order function, uh, what map does is it takes a source array and generates an output array. And there's a one for one between the source and the output. So whatever number of entries you have in your source array, you'll have the same number of entries in your output array, which is different from the filter, obviously. And uh, again, map is a higher order function because it does take a callback and that happens to be also its only argument. And the purpose of the callback in this case is to construct an instance of the shape of the objects that you want in your output array. Uh, like filter, map does not change the source array. So we would say it's a pure function. And so let's see what we did by way of illustration. 
So my objective is here, I want to generate an array containing just a user's name and their email address, I think. Yeah. Okay, so I want to take my, oops, let me do this for a second. Again, I could, uh, I could achieve this objective using an ordinary for loop, which I'm just showing you here, just for the sake of it. But the map is the more JavaScript way of doing it. Here's my map. And again, I'm passing my callback using the arrow style. And what the callback does in this case is it returns an instance of the type of object that you want to put into your output array. So this is the shape of the objects that are going to be inside in this output array. And so I've just decided the objects are just going to have a name property and an email property. And I get the values from the, uh, the person object that's passed in as an argument to my callback. So if I look at to see what it generated, Uh, the first console.log, so I just go back again. First console.log is here. And again, you know, that's just to make sure you understand the structure of the response that comes back from the web API. So that would be all of this stuff, which we've kind of looked at there a while ago. It's fine in terms of the map. This is the array that's generated by my first map call. And you can see each object in this case just has a name and an email. So that looks uh, as if it's working properly. And I've got a second example of using map, I think. Here, my objective is just to find the age of each person and put the ages into an array. So my the callback that I pass to map in this case, uh, it's very simple. It's just just returning that. It's just returning that uh, value. It's not returning an object. It's just returning a value. But that's okay. That now means that this array here is just going to be an array of integer values. And is that what I get? Yep, that looks like what I get. So that's a map, also a higher order uh, function. The third and final one that I want to look at is uh, called reduce. And this is quite different now from the others two uh, at a number of levels. The first thing is, okay, it's a higher order function because it takes a callback as an argument, but it has a second argument as well. And the purpose of this reduce function is to take your source array and compute an accumulator value by going through each element in the source array. Now, the thing is, though, that this notion of an accumulator has a, a very broad meaning. I, I'll give you simple examples of computing an accumulator. An accumulator is typically something that we think about as of as as we go through each element, we're adding some value to an existing value, and we're accumulating uh, a total a total sum, if you like, uh, from my source array. But it's you, you can use the reduce for something much broader than that. So I'm saying that the reduce uh, takes the source array and it computes a single accumulator from that source array. So again, it's going through it's going through each element in the source array and it's invoking my callback for each element in the source array. And presumably inside in the body of the callback is where it computes the current value of this accumulator by taking some property of the, of the array entry that's currently being processed, taking some property of that and using that uh, property to 
somehow update the accumulator that it has computed so far. Now, as well, the callback takes all the arguments that we'd expect. It takes the current element that's being processed in, from my array, the index position of that element if we need it, that's optional. The full array if we need it, that's also optional. But in fact, the very first parameter of my callback is the current value of the accumulator that we've computed so far. And what the callback needs to return is the value of the accumulator that it has computed so far. So if you like, every time this callback is invoked, we're essentially passing the accumulator that we've computed so far. We're passing that on to the next invocation of the callback so that it can use it, update it, and then return the updated value on to the next invocation of the callback. So this, this return value is kind of linked to the first argument of my callback when I invoke it uh, in the subsequent iteration. This down here, this is the second argument of the reduce function. And this argument is meant to be set to the initial value of the accumulator. And it can be very important that you get that right. So let's see an example. Because examples hopefully help us to understand because you can't uh, talk your way through these things sometimes so the same context again uh, an array of user profiles my objective is i want to compute the average age of all of my users and let's do it using reduce so here's my callback And what the reduce in this case is going to do is it's going to compute the total of all of the ages. And then I just compute the average by doing a simple division operation down here. So my initial value for my accumulator is zero, which makes sense. Uh, here's my callback and I'm passing the total that I've computed so far of the ages. And in the body of my callback, I'm taking the current person's age, which is this. I'm adding it to the total that has been passed in to me. And I'm returning that as the result of the callback. And so, as I said, this value here is passed on to the next invocation of my callback, and it's assigned to the total parameter for the for the very first invocation of my callback total is going to have the value zero here's another illustration of using reduce the objective is uh, to find the youngest person in the array uh, now you know, as I stated there, find the youngest person in the array. That wouldn't immediately strike you as being an opportunity to use reduce. But as I said, the reduce higher order function, the notion of the accumulator is much kind of broader than the more conventional meaning of the, the word accumulator. And so here's an example of that, really. I want to get to find the youngest one uh, in the array. And again, we could we could imagine how to do that using a for loop and all of that kind of stuff, but reduce will do the same for you. What's important to get right here is that the initial value, I'm setting the initial value of my quote unquote accumulator to be a hundred because I'm saying, well, there's there's definitely going to be somebody that's younger than that. Uh, if I set the accumulator to zero, then the overall result of my reduce is going to be zero. It's not actually going to work for me. It's not going to find, based on how I express the, the logic in the body of the callback. So I set it to 100, which means the first invocation of my callback, then uh, min is going to be 100. 
I pass in the first user in my array. I check to see is that person's age less than the current uh, less than the current min. If it is less than the current min, then return uh, as the result of this single line statement or this uh, ternary operator return that as a result. Otherwise, re return min as a result of the ternary operator. So new min is either going to be the current person's age or it's going to be assigned the min value that was passed in to me. And then I return new min and on and on it goes. And you can look at that later on yourselves. And now I have a third illustration of using reduce, which is far more complex than the other two. The purpose, or my objective, sorry, uh, in this third use of the reduce is, I essentially want to, this is going to be my accumulator. I want to find out how many people are a less than, uh, is it less than 25 years of age? How many people are between 25 and 50? How many are in this age bracket? How many are in this age bracket? So my accumulator is going to have actual, when it's computed, it's going to have values for each of these age groups. And how I went about it then, um, you know, okay, there's a bit of juggling that needs to go on. First of all, what I do is I call object.keys. This has got nothing to do with uh, reduce now. So I, I grab the keys from this object here. So that means that this thing here now is going to be an array where the values in the array are the keys in this object. I then have a convenience function where I pass in an integer value into the convenience function. And what it will work out, what it will return back to me is which particular key from this set of keys does that value belong to? So if I pass it in 45, then it would return this string to me, essentially. It would return that string. Uh, but that string I can actually use then as a key into this overall object. So that's just a convenience function that I have for myself. Finally, we come to the use of reduce. And what the reduce, and I'm not going to talk my way through this now, but what the reduce does is its initial accumulator is this guy here. And then as it works its way through the array, it's updating the appropriate entry within that accumulator. First of all, finds the person's age and passes that age into my little convenience function to get back the appropriate key. And I then bump up the value associated with that key in my accumulator and then return my updated accumulator uh, onto the next invocation. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, extra work needed there and you, you can go away and study that yourselves. I'll pause for a second, just in case it's a lot to take in really there now, that code. It's by no means straightforward. Okay. Um, let's see. So the overall purpose of all of that anyway was to demonstrate higher order functions, which are functions that take uh, functions as parameters. And it was just one kind of case study. But the that programming style is something that we will see right throughout this, this course, not necessarily in relation to uh, the array type, although we will see it in the array type, but more generally, it's a programming style that we will see a lot and we just need to get comfortable with it. Right. Let's go back to our website. So still 
under the kind of heading of foundations, because when I spoke to you there, the, the very first time I spoke to you, I said that we were going to spend the first week or two uh, covering foundation topics, and then we would start into the new material. So this second card would still come under the heading of foundation uh, for this module. And really all I'm, uh, it's very short now, really. Uh, all I want to do is just get a basic understanding of the workings of the web browser, because that's obviously fundamental too when we're do developing web apps. We have to have a familiarity with how browsers work internally. Um, so there's a set of slides and there's also an archive. The archive is it's not that important, but you can just have a brief look at it. Uh, and I will mention it as I walk my way through the slides. So the web browser is, we're told here, it's an event-driven environment. Uh, that's the way browsers actually work. As you interact with a browser, internally the browser creates uh, what are called event objects, as objects in, in the kind of JavaScript sense. And what you can do is you can associate a piece of JavaScript code with the occurrence of an event. And so what the browser will do is when that event occurs, it will take care of invoking your piece of JavaScript code to do whatever you want it to do. Uh, that's how browsers actually work. And uh, also, you know, if you want a piece of JavaScript code to run once the web page has been loaded into the browser, technically that's an event as well. Uh, so events are not just related to user interaction, but there are other kind of peripheral occurrences that can be modeled, that the browser models as an event. As I've just said, uh, once, a once the web page has been displayed on the screen, that's an event. Once an image has been downloaded from a web API and loaded into the browser, that's an event. If a HTTP request from the browser to Web API fails, the failure, uh, in other words, when we get back some sort of 500 uh, error message from the Web API, that is also modeled as an event, and we may want a piece of JavaScript code to run when that event arises. So everything is modeled around this notion of event-driven programming. Uh, but before we talk about that, uh, what I'm showing you here is actually a slide that I quote unquote robbed from a presentation made by a guy called Douglas Crockford, who I mentioned there at the very top right hand corner. Uh, if you get a chance to just Google Douglas Crockford on YouTube, you'll get very, uh, very good presentations and, and very humorous presentations from him. He is really, but they're always excellent, though. Um, he would be one of the kind of uh, uh, rock stars, if you like, of the web world in the earlier days, uh, admittedly now, the, the, the video clips would be from quite a number of years ago, 10 years, probably 15 years plus, but they're still very informative and they're still applicable or relevant, sorry, to, to today. And what this slide from a presentation that he made uh, is, is describing is essentially how browsers work. And even though this presentation uh, was done a number of years ago, it's still the case today. Browsers essentially work along these lines. And so what it's telling us is 
once the URL in a browser changes, and there are two ways it can change, either the user manually enters a new, new URL in the URL address bar of the browser, or when they click on a hyperlink, that will cause the browser's URL address to change. So once the browser's URL address changes, then immediately the browser goes into what we refer to as fetch mode, which means it sends a request to the relevant web server. Eventually, the web server will respond back with the HTML page. We're thinking think in terms of the static web now rather than the dynamic web. So we get a uh, fully featured web page. That web page is taken by the browser and it creates an internal representation of that web page. The web page, as we know, is written in HTML, which is for human consumption purposes. But uh, th that HTML needs to be represented in a way that is more compatible with the browser. And what it does is it creates a, an object, a JavaScript object representation of that HTML page. And that Java object, object representation is what we call the DOM or the document object model. But it, it is a network, a hierarchy of JavaScript objects. We'll have a brief look at it in, in a few minutes. Then the browser, once it has constructed that DOM, it then goes into what is called its parse phase, where it essentially uh, looks at the DOM, navigates down through it, and creates another internal representation, which we don't really need, we don't ever use or need to uh, uh, understand the structure of it, but it does create another representation of it. Uh, sorry, I went, went, I went one too early there. This is the HTML. The parsing, I beg your pardon. The parsing is the phase where it takes the HTML and creates the DOM from that. I beg your pardon. Once it has fully created the DOM, then it goes into what's called the flow stage, where it analyzes that DOM and creates another representation of it, which is given different names. But back in the earlier days, it was called the display tree, but I'd say it probably has a slightly different label on it now. But it's just another representation, if you like, of the HTML. And it's that display tree representation. That's what the browser uses. And it goes into what's called its paint phase. And the paint phase is where it actually uh, colors out the pixels on the screen. So this, this flow from fetch phase to parse phase to flow phase to paint phase is what happens every single time the URL address in the browser changes. And of particular importance to us is this DOM structure uh, that is created because it, it is a JavaScript object representation and we can write JavaScript code which can interrogate this DOM and make changes to it. And anytime the DOM changes, immediately the browser goes back into flow phase, paint phase and repaint. That's what I'm showing you here on the next slide. It's also borrowed from that same presentation um, by Crockford. So once what, what this slide is describing is the flow within a browser provided the URL address does not change. And so you can maybe start down here in the bottom right. Events start occurring and the events typically now would relate to user interaction. So any type of user, user interaction, as I was saying in the outset, that user interaction is modeled by the browser in the form of an event. So it essentially creates an object uh, describing that event with key value pairs. We can associate a piece of JavaScript code with that event. We can tell the browser, look, run this piece of JavaScript when a particular event occurs. I'll show you in a, in a moment how we uh, how we encode that, that link between the two. Once we have told the browser about that link, then when the events actually occur, it will execute our script code for us. The script code can do anything you want it to do. But in particular, if the script code changes the DOM data structure, which it can, then once the DOM has changed, immediately the browser will respond by re 
uh, entering its flow phase. In other words, it analyzes the DOM. We had that on the previous screen. It reanalyzes the DOM, constructs a new display tree, and paints that new display tree on the screen. Hence, we've got a dynamic web page, a web page that is changing based on the user interaction. And it remains in this cycle of phases as long as the browser's URL address does not change. So we could have lots of uh, scripts linked to lots of different types of events in our code. And every time a particular event happens, then our piece of script code will execute and potentially change the DOM. It could as well make a HTTP call to a web API and retrieve some data, and then maybe use that data to update the DOM in some way. Now, back then when uh, Douglas Crockford made this presentation, uh, DOM was not the uh, label that we put on the, the network of JavaScript nodes or JavaScript objects. It was back then it was called the document tree structure, uh, but it's essentially the same thing. And so what I'm showing you here, a very simple illustration. Let's say on the right, we have some HTML. Now uh, the indentation is slightly misleading. So key here, paragraph is not embedded within the H1. It's it's kind of a sibling of it. It's at the same level. H2 is at the same level as well. That's just by the way. Uh, but on the right then is a, a kind of a, a representation, a very high level represent, representation of what the DOM might look like for this simple HTML page. Now, each object in our DOM we refer to as a node. And so at the very top of the DOM, there's going to be uh, a standard object called the document object. It's going to have a child within it, uh, a property within it, and that property is going to, we refer to as the HTML property within our document, but it's just the kind of key value pair and so on down. And eventually we get down to objects or nodes within our structure, within our DOM structure, where the nodes actually correspond one-to-one -to, -one to a particular element within our HTML. And on the extreme left then, you know, I'm just using ordinary dot notation to navigate down through my network of objects. So the expression document dot body is going to refer to this node here. And I might have that inside in one of my scripts. Focusing in on the kind of the, the lower part of that DOM structure. So I have my body node. And what the uh, what the browser will do is as it's constructing this DOM, it will add in various pointers to other nodes. So what I'm doing here is that each node is actually going to have a pointer to its first child and its last child uh, uh, node. Also, each node will have a reference to its sibling, its immediate sibling, and its preceding sibling. And you can have references, there are references between a node and its parent. And because this is a tree structure, each node only has one parent. So all of these additional pointers, they're actually uh, added into our DOM structure by the browser when it's constructing it. And the purpose of all of these pointers are to help us navigate the DOM uh, when we're writing our JavaScript code. Essentially, though, you don't need all of them. If you just had, if you just concentrated on the uh, arrows that I'm showing you now, that they are sufficient to be able to fully navigate from any node to any node uh, within the DOM. So if you want to go from the body right down to, you know, this node here, clearly you go from here to here, then hop across each of these and then down one and you get there. So, you, okay, while you have all of these other ways of navigating as well, you know, if that is sufficient. 
now just by way uh, if if you haven't sort of looked at this kind of stuff before all i'm showing you here is a screenshot but if you go back to the website and just grab this archive grab this archive download it unzip it and import it into eclipse And just close off some stuff here. When you do unzip it, you will get this folder. And again, we're going to use the live server. Now, in this case, it's just uh, some HTML files. I've got a couple of them. Although I've also got some uh, script code, I think. But let's just start up our live server. And if we look at the 01 file, Okay, that's, uh, I think that's what I'm showing you on the PowerPoint slides, yep. Yeah. And it's purposefully, it's a very simple web page, but if we open up our developer tools, uh, as you may know, the, the prompt here, the console prompt, we can actually write a line of JavaScript code at the prompt and when we hit return, that code is executed, okay? But for what we can, so in terms of what we might be able to usefully do here in relation to what we're talking about is, I can access the DOM from here because it's just gonna be JavaScript code. So I know that there is a global object called document. And I can navigate into it. So if I go document.body, dot, let's say first, first element child, uh, that expression is going to evaluate to the first child element of the body of the current page. And you know, you know that's going to be. If I open up the actual page in in raw form, uh, the first child is going to be my H one. And so when I hit return here, it it's giving me back the okay for convenience sake. It's showing me the response in the form of HTML. But really, this expression here that I've typed is actually referring to a particular node within my DOM structure. And in this case, it's a node corresponding to the uh, H1 element from my HTML. And all the screenshot is showing you is just some other examples. Uh, if I go on to the next slide, I think. Yeah. Uh, all I'm showing you here are just some examples of how you can navigate around the DOM programmatically because this is just JavaScript code. Okay, we're just typing it at the console prompt, but we could have it within a piece of, within a function, and that function could be linked to some event uh, within my browser runtime. So that's... Uh, this idea of navigating the DOM programmatically. It's pretty long-winded and uh, you, can, you can be assured we won't be doing this kind of uh, programming at all in this module, but it's very low level DOM manipulation. We will be doing a lot of DOM manipulation, but certainly not down at this kind of uh, metal level. It will be at a much higher, more developer friendly programming approach towards it, which is using the React framework. But fundamentally, the React code that we will be writing, albeit at a very high level and a much more easier way to program DOM manipulation, when all of the code that we write in React gets converted back into plain old JavaScript, 
it's all of this kind of stuff that's going to be going on behind the scenes, which is why I'm kind of covering it uh, at this early stage. So in the previous slide, I showed you how you can navigate the DOM. What I'm showing you in this one is uh, an example of changing the DOM. And so I'm just going to talk my way through this line by line, and then uh, we'll leave it at that for today. So the very first statement here is, this is how you can actually create a, if you like create a piece of HTML, really what we're doing is we're creating a, a node programmatically. Uh, so the document object I'm, I said to you is the document object is a network of JavaScript objects that represents the HTML page. But in addition to that, the document object has a number of methods associated with it, and you can use those methods for various purposes. One method is the create element method. And what that does, as its name suggests, is it creates a new HTML element or a new node, but it just creates the node in isolation. It does not attach it to the DOM. So it looks like I'm creating a, a node to represent a button. The next line, I'm creating another uh, node. In this case, I'm creating a node to represent a piece of text. In this line here, I'm attaching the text node to the button node. In other words, the button is going to have some sort of a caption. Now, so far, if you were, if I was typing this in one by one, this code line by line in, when I hit return here, you're not going to see any button appearing on the left hand side because I haven't made any change to the DOM yet. I'm creating kind of nodes in isolation. It's not until this line of code executes. And what this line of code is doing, as you can uh, hopefully try and work out is, um, I'm somehow, what am I doing? I'm going document.body. I'm taking the third, this is another way of navigating the DOM. I'm taking the third child element, which in my case would be, uh, the third child uh, one, well, I think that third child is actually going to be this one as far as I know. Let's go back for one second. And again, so the body has first, second, oh, the third child is going to be a div. Okay, and taking the third child and I'm appending to that child. In other words, I'm appending on onto the div, not within the div, but essentially after the div. I'm appending my button. Now, the append here is uh, clearly, that's going to change the structure of the DOM. Now, when I hit return here, that will cause my browser to go back into its flow phase and paint phase. And only then will you see the button appearing on the screen. But having said all of that, okay, my this is an example of a dynamic web page, and I'm programming this dynamic web page by doing very low level DOM manipulation, uh, which is very uh, kind of programmer uh, unfriendly, if you like. So that's amending the DOM. And there are the two essential. We can browse, we can navigate the DOM, we can amend the DOM. So we really have all we need to know to be able to write a web app, a front-end web app. Now we would certainly not code it in the way that I'm showing you there for obvious reasons. What I'm showing you here is uh, I'm saying, okay, it's all based around events. And as well, I'm also telling you that the browser not only is it an, is it an event-driven environment, although we haven't seen events so far, all I'm showing you is DOM manipulation. Um, it's an event-driven environment, number one. It's a single-threaded environment, so you can't... Uh, so at, even though events might be occurring, uh, multiple events might be occurring at the same time, because we only have a single-threaded programming environment, only one event 
can be kind of processed at a time. So there is a delay between the, the occurrence of the event and any processing that you might want to have associated with that event occurrence. Uh, hence, it's uh, hence it's asynchronous. It's an asynchronous environment. You know the 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 reaction to an event occurring is not immediate. It, it, the reaction will be sometime in the future. And what what are events? Well, essentially anything could uh, could uh, constitute an event. So here are some of the obvious examples: user interaction, uh, the page loading an image loading, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I, on this slide and the next one, I I've have listed pretty much every possible type of event. Don't know where I got these, but I got them somewhere. So if you scan down through them, you, you can see that uh, it covers quite a broad spectrum um, of things that are happening within your browser. Conventionally, uh, events, these, the events have names and the names all begin with on, okay? And the, the camel case is the, uh, is the, is the, uh, the naming convention. So lots of uh, events there that we can possibly program against. Where am I on time? Okay. All right, I think I'll, uh, even though I've only got a few slides to go, I'm going to freeze it there and I'll complete this set of slides the next day, which should take no more than uh, uh, 15 minutes, I think. And then we'll get into uh, what you really uh, enrolled on this module for, I would uh, guess, which is to start looking at the, the React framework. So we'll leave it at that for today. And... I'll talk to you on Thursday. So the, the lab for this week, even though I kind of gather that some of you have already completed it, the lab for this week would be the functions lab. And okay, if you've already done it, then uh, you've got a week off if you like, but if you haven't, then have a go at this lab here, which involves using the uh, array higher order functions that I've been talking about, although I'm using a different web API than the random user web API. So uh, see how you get on with that. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much.